Who wants to choose a certain board game? Just use Google Hangout. Yeah. I've had some people that have experimented with that in Ustream. And that, like the problem with Ustream is like you don't like buy the subscription. Exactly. All the ads you just get bombed like every 15 yeah. minutes. And it's, and it's pretty expensive the subscription. Yeah. Like, it's free. So yeah, I've got I think Ustream is better than having like hundreds of people being on. Uh, uh, it's, can I go ahead and push it? And he streams like my buddy streams high school sporting events. And uh, and that's like you said, unless you've got a pretty big subscription base, it can get really pricey real quick. Yeah.
Today, uh, please be mindful that we are recording um, video and audio today. Uh, we are going to do House Bill 31st, and I, uh, due to our time element today, uh, we would like to see a show of hands for those that are going to testify for the bill. Please raise your hand. Those against? Those for informational purposes only. Okay. Um, we will not be accepting this bill today. Uh, we do have several witnesses, as you can see, lots of people here to um, be in the committee today. And there's probably several that have driven quite a way. So be very cognizant of the fact that we only have about an hour and a half to take care of this. So uh, do not. Just present your material in a in a uh, confined way, okay? Don't repeat and so forth. So, with that, um, Mr. Duggar. Good morning, uh, Madam Chairman. For the record, my name is Tony Duggar. I represent the 141st District, which is all of Wright County and the eastern half of Webster County. And uh, members of the committee and Madam Chairman, thank you very much for uh, hearing my bills today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, House Bill 30. Uh, if you've been on this committee uh, in the past, uh, you're not seeing any new information here today. Uh, this is basically the same bill that uh, I have been presenting uh, for the last several years that I have been here. But for the new members, I think that we should go through this bill and kind of dissect it so that you are very familiar with what I am doing here with House Bill 30. So I'm going to just go down the list of the uh, of the bill and. Uh, Kind of tell you where I'm at as we're going through this so that you can follow along with me. So if you're looking on page one, uh, basically it is a requirement for a photo ID to be eligible to vote in the uh, state of Missouri. And if you look there, you will see that I am requiring it either be a non-expired Missouri driver's license, a non-expired or a non-expiring Missouri non-driver's license, a document that satisfies all the following requirements. It contains the name of the individual who the document was issued and the name substantially conforms to the most recent signature in the individual voter registration record. The document shows a photograph of the individual and the document includes an expired expiration date and the document is not expired or if expired, the document expired after the date of the most recent general election. The document was issued by the United States or the state of Missouri or any identification containing a photograph of the individual which is issued by the Missouri National Guard, U.S. Armed Forces, or the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to a member or former member of the Missouri National Guard or the United States Armed Forces and it is not expired or does not have an expiration date. Then if you go on to part two there, You'll see that I am taking all the costs that are associated with implementing this process and putting it to the state of Missouri. I don't think that we should implement this and put the cost back on the election authorities or the local uh, election boards. I think if we're going to implement this, the state of Missouri should bear all the costs. So that section takes care of the costs that's associated with this bill that they will be to the state of Missouri. If there's no appropriation from the state, then this bill would not go uh, into effect. They would not be required to do this photo ID requirement. Then if you look at the uh, next session, 
it deals with uh, the election authority posting uh, the requirements at each uh, polling place. Then if you look down to the bottom of page two, uh, number two, you will see that it says an inability to pay for a birth certificate or other supporting documentation that is necessary to obtain the ID required to vote under this section. These are, these are people that would be allowed to cast a provisional ballot in the state of Missouri. Let me let me explain to some of the new people on here exactly what a provisional ballot was and what it has been created for here in the state of Missouri. A provisional ballot was created so that an individual showing up to the polls to vote who is not on the precinct register, it does not appear that they're registered to vote, but they are certain that they're registered to vote. In the state, they're allowed to cast a provisional ballot, which then goes back after the polling place closes to the local election authority or the election boards and it gives them some time to try to track down this voter to make sure that they were were or were not registered to vote and you're going to hear testimony today that provisional ballots are not counted in the state of missouri or you're going to hear a very low percentage of provisional ballots are not counted in the state of missouri and that's correct and the reason is, is because these people are not registered to vote. Once the election authorities have taken the time to go back and look at the data on these provisional ballot envelopes, they find that this person was not registered to vote. So the likelihood of, of the provisional ballot being counted in today's law would be very rare. I mean, it's going to be a small number, but I'm creating a new uh, use of the provisional ballot here with the photo ID. So don't don't let uh, the people, the testimony today, tell you that provisional ballots, these provisional ballots won't be counted because if they are correctly done, they will be counted. Okay, if you look, uh, I also exempted out uh, anyone who was born on or before January 1st, 1950. Uh, if they do not have a photo ID, they would also be able to cast a uh, absent or a provisional ballot. Okay, those provisional ballots, once that they are cast and they don't have this photo ID, would then go back to the election authority. The election authority would look at the signature on this provisional ballot envelope and look at the signature that's on file. Uh, on their voter registration card where they register to vote. If these signatures match up, then this provisional ballot would be counted. So they would just check the signatures. If the signatures match, then these exceptions, they would be able to count this provisional ballot. If you look at the bottom of page three, you will also see for the voter who shows up who just forgot to bring their ID, uh, they're in a hurry. They're not going to have time to come back and vote. They also can cast a provisional ballot. They have three days uh, then to return back to the election authority and bring their uh, photo ID, and then their provisional ballot would also be counted. But this this is a person who does not meet any of the exemptions. Maybe they come to the polls at five till seven before the polls close on election night. They don't have time to go home to get ID they still get to vote. I don't want anyone, I want to make it clear, I am not trying to exclude anyone from voting in the state. I want everyone who is eligible to vote to be able to cast a ballot in the state. So I'm not trying, I've tried to make exceptions for every single person that I can think of. So that person would be allowed to vote and as long as they show up with their ID within three days, their ballot would then be counted. If you look on page four, um, Number eight, which requires, it says, the state and all fee offices shall provide one such form of personal identification required to vote at no cost to any otherwise qualified voter who does not already possess such ID and who desires the ID in order to vote. So this is just requiring that, uh, that we do provide that free of cost to them. 
Then if you look over to page 6, uh, 115, 430, this is the provisional ballot section that was already in law. And all I'm doing here is going in and creating the provisional ballot to be applied to photo ID. So I'm just making another reason that you can get that the use of the provisional ballot in the state of Missouri. So I'm just adding that to the provisional ballot section. Then if you look over to the very last page in the very last sentence, section B, it says, Section A of this Act shall become effective only upon the passage and approval by the voters of the constitutional amendment submitted to them by the General Assembly regarding the authorization of photo ID requirements for elections by general law. So this bill does not go into effect unless we pass the constitutional amendment, which will be the next bill that I present to this committee today. This does not go into effect unless the voters of the state pass the HJR. So that is the nuts and bolts of this bill. This bill is going into statute. It's not going into the Constitution. Uh, this bill can be changed uh, from legislature to legislature as it's being worked out. It's still a work in progress. I'm still open to anything that anyone would have that would make this bill better. So let me make that clear that this this bill is a work in progress. With that being said, many of you are going to ask, why am I doing this? Why am I wanting to require a photo ID? And I'm just, it, it's simple. I want to protect the integrity of elections in the state of Missouri. I am 100% sure that voter impersonation fraud is taking place in the state of Missouri. And I think this photo ID is the only way that we can fix it. And I think that every vote should count, but I think in order for you to vote that you should be eligible to vote, you shouldn't be trying to cheat. You shouldn't be trying to impersonate someone else in the state because it's not fair to that person. Every vote should count and every person, I want every person to vote who is entitled to vote. I am not trying to keep anyone from voting in the state. But with that, Madam Chairman, uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Committee, remember, we'll have a time later that we can discuss this. So remember, we have people that have come quite a distance today to witness. So let's be, uh, let's be cognizant of our time. All right. Are the questions of this witness? Ms. Newton. Chair and Choir, Madam Chair. Good morning, Representative. Good morning. I really don't know where to start on your bill. Um, there's so much wrong with it that I'm not exactly speechless, but I am just uh, amazed that you have the chutzpah to keep bringing this back to this committee. I mean, I'm amazed uh, because we know there's so much wrong in there. Um, this has been, as you pointed out, 10 straight years that this bill has been introduced in the legislature. Um, I find it amazing that in 10 straight years you've been unable to pass it out. Um, well, and I'm also, Representative, I have been able to pass it out of the House with, with pass it out of the legislature. But funny, I have not been able to get it through the Senate. Right, which I'm still amazed, even though we know there are Senate bills being filed at the same time. The other reason that I have such a amazement that this effort is continuing again for 10 straight years is the absence of history. We already know that racial inequities have been exposed in our state around the country. Most recently, we also know that um, the anniversary of particularly the March on Selma, where the fight for voter rights have been ex uh, not just exposed, but been celebrated, but they've also taught us that this never ends. And that's why I guess I'm amazed that your legislation keeps coming back, even though we keep pointing out to you what is wrong. Uh, I'm also amazed that you don't really talk about the impact on voters, um, current existing eligible voters who have been voting just fine, who are not impersonating other people, uh, that this bill has that dramatic impact um, on so many types of voters, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing more about it. But 
it's real clear to me that this is a purely political agenda. As you mentioned, you're talking about eligible voters, but yet your bill is changing that eligibility, which again, to me, comes back to the word uh, disfranchisement. Do you know the definition of that, Representative? Sure, I do. But that's not what I am doing in this bill. You tell me one person that I have not made an exception for in this bill. Well, there's only one group of people you've made exceptions for. And even that exemption isn't politically uh, astute because the uh, examples that you're given for them or the recourse you're given for them isn't exactly true. You're carving out people born before 1950. There are many people still that would be impacted in the state who are not born before 1950. And I want to ask you, why that certain group? Why just them? But that's not the only group that I've carved out. I've carved out anyone who's born before 1950. I also carved out anybody who cannot come up with the documentation or can't afford the documentation to get the uh, photo ID. I've, I've carved them out as well. I don't think you can come up with one single person that I have not made an exception for. So tell me who that is. Well, you've been here for a lot of witnesses who are going to talk about real people who are going to be impacted by this. And the thing I want to point out to you, this is not just particularly in Missouri. We know this effort has been tried um, around the country, many states. Uh, we know that courts have exposed the inequities um, beyond this proposal. Uh, we also know that members of your own party have exposed their intent. And I think we have to keep remembering what is the intent behind this bill. The intent is to change the voting laws so there's certain people who will not be able to vote. And your exemptions do not allow for them to continue to vote. What about the voter who's been impersonated here? Did not get to cast their vote. Well, <laughs> Mr. Thunib, you talked about your belief that that happens, but you did not provide us with any example of that actually happening in Missouri. Well, I do have an example of that. You have one example? I have an example of that happening in Missouri. Actually. How many examples do you have? I is have, it one voter? I have one. Well, if one voter is cheated out of their vote, do you not think we should address that? So therefore, hundreds of other people can't we, vote because you believe that there might have been. And I, I think that there is probably way more than one, and you know as well as I do that that's very possible. Because how, tell me, I mean, you're an attorney, correct? I am not an attorney. You're not an attorney? Okay. Tell me how you would, would prove a case of voter impersonation fraud. Tell me how you would do it. Well, then how do you believe if you can't prove that there actually is voter fraud? We had a case in Jackson County in 2012 where a lady got off work. She came to vote just to find out that she had somebody had already voted. Somebody had stolen a piece of mail from her and had already cast their vote for her. That lady did not get to cast her vote in the November election. Do you think that was fair? A representative, was that was that case documented? Was that case um, prosecuted? How, did that, did that, was that tell me how you're going case? to prosecute that case. How are you going to track down that voter who came in with that material? How are you going to do it? Well, representative, no way you're talking about changing voter laws that have been in existence here in Missouri for, since 1871. We have not excluded people. We've actually included people as our laws have changed. I'm not excluding and anyone here today either. To talk about something that's hypothetical that you believe that has not been documented that you cannot prove, to change laws to make it harder and to exempt people from voting is wrong. Thank you, Representative. How you doing this morning? Good. All right, good. We seem to find each other on either we're agreeing or disagreeing on something. We're in the middle of something. And it's okay, Representative, to uh, disagree. It is, it is. And I do disagree with this bill and have since I've been here. Um, and I know you've been on like a quest to uh, to move this forward, but uh, it, it, it's it's hitting a uh, wall. It's a, a, a wall every time. Um, do you know what the issue with this is in the, in the Senate when the, when the bill gets over there? Why does it always die? You know, I think 
Um, of course, the Senate operates under different rules than the House does. And uh, they have the filibuster, of course, that they have to deal with on that side of the building. So I think that, uh, you know, that within itself is probably what hurts this bill. I think the votes are on the, to pass it are there on the Senate side. I think just getting to that uh, point has not happened at, at this point. I mean, it has happened in the past. We, we have seen it get through, but uh, it's been a little rough. So, so in, in my opinion, it's not like a priority item for the, uh, for the Senate. I wouldn't say that. If, yeah, if it was, it, it would have passed. It's been going on 10 years. Um, uh, that, that's a long time. So I, I don't see it as, as being a, a priority item. So this, this is kind of how I look at it. There's a lot of things going on here. we got a lot of time constraints. There's a lot of people that need to testify uh, that are here. Um, I think this is a, made to be a hindrance, a, a, a hiccup in the system. To discourage people actually sounds good okay we're protecting your right to, to, to vote um, bring an ID uh, but for certain populations it, it causes an issue and uh, sometimes you think somebody you hear these stories about birth certificates and you start to think ah they're the, the, the exception you know it's a uh, isolated incident but, but it's not for, for example a lot of uh, I belong to a group called African American a lot of us came from the South. And uh, my mother, for example, she's from Mississippi, both mother and father. And if I showed you my mother's birth certificate, you would think that she made it up. She was born by a midwife, name spelled wrong, birth date is wrong, like everything's wrong on it, and it's scribbled. So there were some things that changed, and I think with the Patriot Act a few years ago, when you had to go renew your license and you had to get all this additional documentation, so she had to make a visit to Mississippi because the way her birth certificate looked was so crazy. I mean, it, nobody would believe it. I don't, it, it, it's funny, it looks like a child made it. Uh, she's born in some small county in Mississippi, county clerk buildings like a house, and it was stuck in a basement somewhere. So when they, she went down there to get a new one. Uh, she was down there for a week, actually. They finally dug it up. And what they did was the same piece that she had they photocopied it and put it on a piece of paper that said, you know, um, uh, Jackson County, Mississippi, but it's the same thing. And if you look at it, everything's still wrong. So they didn't go out of their way to, to, to make sure that the birth certificate was done. Well, and it's not an isolated thing. It happens a lot. If you talk to a lot of people from the South period that were born by midwives and weren't necessarily allowed access into some of the finer uh, hospital establishment. They have a, a history of that. So she was able to take a week off to go down there to get that, to get it together. But she's now retired. Um, but she wouldn't fall up under the exemption that you have with, with 1950 because she was born uh, after that date. Um, so 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 that's a big issue. So that caused a, a hindrance, and it's not, just not her. I was talking to Representative uh, uh, Joe Adams, who represents the same thing with his mother. Talking to Representative Pace, same thing with her mother. Uh, talking to Representative Pearson, um, born in Ripley County, Tennessee, he's had issues doing doing the thing. So it's a hindrance in the system. And, and and what you have, and we all know this nationwide, if you've got a hiccup on election day, and you've got turnout that is low, there's normally a political party that benefits from that. So if you cause any hiccup in that system, you disenfranchise certain groups, there's always a group that benefits from it, and it's historically you've seen that. So I, I have an issue with that part, um, along with many other. Uh, I, I had another uh, question, and I was looking at um, the identification part. So uh, any driver's license, non-driver's license issued by the state of Missouri that is valid, correct? Uh, a passport? Because that's from the U.S. government, would that be? Okay, it's got a photo. Um, no student IDs, correct? So if I go to the University of Missouri, uh, I'm from Iowa, I come here, um, I have my driver's license. I may not be driving, for example, but I've got a, a student ID. That would not fall up under this, okay? So I would 
have to uh, use state dollars in order to get an ID. So putting that on, on my back, I don't want to pay for your ID. Um, and another one was, and I asked you about this on the floor last year, was uh, if I've got a concealed and carry from Utah, that wouldn't work. I can use it to carry my firearm here in the state of Missouri, and we've got a reciprocity agreement with Utah, and that's okay. So I can I can be armored up, which I do have a concealed and carry from Utah and, and from Missouri. Got to be covered. <laughs> this is a crazy idea, but uh, but that wouldn't be used, and that's that's one of the issues that I don't get. So we'll trust another state into. <laughs> Uh, with that kind of ID requirement, but when it comes to voting, we can't. So we're protecting the, the Second Amendment, so to speak, that way. But we can't, we don't entrust voting with the state of Utah. So why the, why the disparity there? Why would I be able to not use another identification from another state that may be valid, that I can use in some circumstances? Here in the state of Missouri, not for any purposes. Gentlemen, <laughs> I know I'm requiring a photo ID. Uh, no, but, but not from, okay. So, that, yeah, I, I got a little, little. That, so, so that makes me kind of feel like there's something here. There's something. Why will we take it for one thing, an ID from a different state? But we won't take it for voting. Is, is there a difference in the rights or, or I know. application process? Today, gentlemen, I'm dealing with voting uh -huh. uh, and the requirements for that. So, and I'm looking at just standard of right. identification for voting. Right. Uh, why not? That's what I'm dealing with today. Okay. Uh, I, I think that should be opened up. Uh, and, and I think there's an, an issue there. So, we, we've got a process where I can register to vote. And not necessarily have the same identification requirements, but then I can't vote. But to vote, I have to use. There's a whole different set of criteria. That, that, that's kind of funny too. So I, I've got the right to vote, and it's one set of standards. And then when I actually want to exercise that right, there's another set of standards. I think that's problematic. I think it's a trap almost. We've well, got the right to vote, but not necessarily. Unless you have these documents, this, this identification that you must purchase, so you have to buy something, in a sense, directly or indirectly, uh, in order to get this right to vote. And, I, and I've got an issue with that. Do you have an issue with that now? Um, registration and the actual process. No, maybe we need to take a look at the uh, voter registration requirements as well. Okay. okay. That's an idea. I, I don't agree with but we've got rights. I think they should all be the same standard, highest work. Uh, I would think in 10 years you would have had the streets uh, in turmoil, people uh, demonstrating and protesting about this issue, if it was a major issue, which it's really a non-issue, which it's just a hindrance for me to vote. So, um, yeah, just, just, just so those are some of the issues I had, I have with this, and I guess we'll revisit this a little later. I don't want to call all the time. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chair, I just a discussion point with the chair. Um, I have a number of questions that involve uh, some of the more technical aspects of the legislation. And in lieu of the time frame that we're limited to and the number of people, I would just request that uh, prior to adjourning that uh, we, I might be recognized to take up some of the inquiries of some of the technical in regard to provisional balloting, uh, registration, ID, and things of that nature. So if uh, that would be okay, I would certainly yield the floor right now. Uh, Mr. Kidd. Good 
morning, Representative. Good morning. Has there been a lot of legislation uh, through the last 10 years or so that uh, hasn't passed and then eventually got passed on the floor and through the House, through the Senate, and signed into law? It has, hasn't yes. it? Yes. So 10 years is really not germane to this issue, is it? No, it isn't. Okay. Um, and honestly, I think this photo ID has been passed through the Senate in the last 10 years. So the, the amount of times you file this is really not germane to this issue. Thanks, sir. Anyone else of the committee that would like to address? Mr. Okay, moving on. Uh, we have a witnesses three, four, eight against, and three for informational purposes. So let's be very cognizant of that fact. And also, we have another bill that we have to hear. So. Uh, right now, uh, is there anyone here that would like to witness in favor of the bill? Ms. Neely. Hi, I am Donna Neely. I'm the election authority for Taney County, Missouri. We're famous for Branson and tourism. Come see me, spend your tax dollars, please. As the election authority, I see a lot of things that happen, and I'm here to share one story with you in particular. Um, I had a call from a gentleman who wanted to receive an absentee ballot. He had already sent in an application, and we actually had an absentee ballot in the office. We told him we had an absentee ballot signed by him. He said it wasn't his absentee ballot. The gentleman showed up in my office a few days later and demanded to see the absentee ballot. And he insisted that he had not voted that absentee ballot. So to resolve the issue, we looked at his ID and I requested to see his photo ID, not knowing who the gentleman was. We gave him a second absentee ballot envelope with ballot enclosed. We marked the original absentee ballot 301A. The second absentee ballot, we marked it 301B. <coughs> um, I took it before the verification team on election day, which is made up of one Republican, one Democrat, and myself, or one of my deputies. We reviewed both of the absentee ballots with all of the signatures we pulled the original voter ID card, compared all the signatures. That was the only thing that we had to do. That was the only evidence that we had. So we had to make a determination as to which ballot we were going to open. Since the signatures all seemed to match, we disregarded the second ballot and the judges opened the first absentee ballot. Now, whether or not that first ballot was from that voter and he just wanted to change his vote or whether or not somebody committed fraud. There was no way for me to know because the individual who had presented the first absentee ballot could have used a utility bill or a bank statement and there would be no way for me to know if that was the individual standing on the other side of our counter. So that's my story. I have other things, but this one in particular has to do with voter ID. I do know that fraud exists. I have stopped people from voting in my county trying to use old voter ID cards when I knew that they had moved to Green County. And if it hadn't been for the Missouri um, MCVR, Missouri Centralized Voter Registration, I would not have been able to know that that individual was then registered in another county. Voter fraud does exist, and I would like to um, support voter ID so we can help stop it in our county. And across the state. All right. Any questions of this witness? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Donna. You might, Ms. Neely, you might be here. One moment. Thanks, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh -huh. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else to witness in favor of the bill? <coughs> Hello, my name is Mitch Hubbard. I want to thank the sponsor of this bill for his determination to keep going with it. We definitely need photo ID in the state. And I will give this not not as an example that we need to discuss, but just as an example of persistence and why it's important on, on an issue that, that is important. In England, we had William Wilberforce, who for 30 years 
file legislation to end the slave trade. It took 30 years, but he kept doing it. And this is not a comparable issue, but sometimes it's important to keep important issues in, in the forefront, even if they don't pass right away, is my only point. Um, I do agree with Representative Smith with one point that he mentioned about his mother, and that is that it is important to make sure that all voters have the opportunity to vote and that we are not keeping them from voting. And, and I think Representative Duggar has tried to do that. Um, but I think there's a broader issue, and I, I mentioned this last year when I testified here. There's a broader issue with photo ID for voting is that in order to get your social security or to do so many things to be a productive part of society, you have to have a photo ID. So I think it's important beyond this committee that we help people like Representative Smith's mother get their ID so that they can be a productive citizen. Because if you don't have an ID, there's so many things you can't do. Open up a bank account, those kind of things. So I, I am going to make a few suggestions to this committee and Representative Duggar might consider making to this bill. Um, the first is addressing that issue and, and addressing absentee voting, but I'll come to that sec second. But first is absentee voting. It's not addressed in this issue. Um, as some of you know, I ran for Secretary of State in 2008 against Robin Carnahan. We had one debate, and in that debate, although she didn't admit that there was a problem with election fraud, she did admit in response to me that the, most of the issues in elections have to do with absentee voting. So I think we need to, to address that issue in this, and I think it's very simple. Those who are required by law currently mm -hmm. to, to sign an affidavit, which, which those who are permanently handicapped, those who are voting in the military, some of those have exclusions, but most people who vote absentee by mail have to sign an affidavit that that's them. They show their ID to the, to the notary. It would be very simple. It shouldn't cost the voter anything. It should be provided, but they could send in a copy of that ID along with it. Then you don't have that because if you go to Heritage Action, I didn't bring it with me today. I did last year, and I testified to it. If you go to Heritage Action, there are some cases on there that deal with election fraud. And in one case, I believe it was in Alabama, there were 4,000. It was in a Democratic primary. The Democratic county clerk, along with the other elected officials, were actually committing voter fraud. They were actually filling out absentee ballots. And because there was such a significant number of absentee ballots they got caught but the point is is that if you had somebody who's going to go to that that trouble all they have to do is have somebody there as a notary to, to be in that line filling out those ballots so just a notary alone is not enough we need that absentee ballot to come with that um, beyond that i would as a committee consider really the points that that representative duggar brought up uh, on page two lines 28 through 30 the, f the first part of that is excellent Line 26 to 28 is excellent. It says that the state will pay for the cost of the elections. The state should pay for the cost. The county should not have to pick up those costs. I fully support that. But the, se the second sentence in that is that if there is no appropriation and distribution of state funds, the election authority shall not enforce the photo identification requirements of this section. Photo ID is important not only to stop actual election fraud, it is important for the perception of election fraud. Because in that case I mentioned, and if you look up here to Jackson, read that case, you'll find that. Democratic voting in that county after after they stopped, stopped the fraud actually increased because people had faith in the elections. So that's why this is important. I would remove that sentence because one, the cost of providing the photo IDs is not that that prohibitive and there, and we should just pay for it, the state should pay for it and there should be no reason in the future that somebody would take away that right. Because just consider in the future that the legislature is struggling that year in their budget. They defund photo ID whether it costs a million dollars or whatever the cost would be for that year. I, I think it would probably be less after the first year. But regardless of what the cost is, they defund it. And then there's some issue in, in, in an election. And there's a question whether the, there was fraud. Now the people have lost their integrity because it looks suspicious that that was removed that year when there was a possible, possibility of fraud. The second thing I will address is line 48 through 49 on page two. And this is, again, an exception that I think Mr. Representative Smith would agree that needs to be there. An inability to pay for a birth certificate or other supporting documentation that is necessary to obtain the, the identification required to vote under this section that allows them to vote provisionally. My thing is back to my first point, is that if somebody, this exception swallows the rule in my opinion. Somebody who's actually going to commit voter fraud is actually out to do that. All I have to do is go to the, to the election authority sign the document that says that they cannot afford their supporting documentation and go ahead and vote whether they're actually that person or not 
so we need that photo ID. So what I recommend is that the committee find at least so many people each year, whatever you can budget, and get get them their supporting documents. So one, they can be a participating member of society, and two, they can have a photo ID so that we know that they're vote who they are when they vote. And then if they if they if the state doesn't have enough funds to cover everybody, those people would fall under the exception until the next appropriation. That's my recommendation. So otherwise, I, I recommend that this be, this bill be passed. Thank you, Mr. Herbert. Mr. Good morning, Madam Chair. Okay, you touched on a point. I saw a couple people in the third or fourth row raise their heads. Uh, you're saying that if the state fails to appropriate and distribute its funding, the program continues, who would pay for it? Well, what I'm saying is that the state should not be allowed to not fund it. It's not, if you look at the state budget, which is, I don't know, 24, 25 billion, somewhere in there, and I may be off by a billion or two, but if you look at three or four million, which is going to cost to, to fund photo ID, it's such a small amount that I think there's no reason the state couldn't fund that to have election integrity. It should always fund it. But and that's my point. Uh, I, just a quick follow up. We're not appropriating what we should for education that's in the statutes. We're not appropriating the amount of money in the statutes for prisoner per diem. We're not funding the amount of money for the appraisal and assessment of property. All three of those are commitments that the state made to the local governments that said they would fund. So I don't see what the exception would be on this program if it's one year someone wanted to come out and strike out the funding. The cost would still be been set up on the local governments. So I, uh, I understand what you're saying about the mandate, but we've had a lot of mandates come through this building that we no longer fund. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Mr. Smith. Oh, just a quick question. Thank you for coming to testify. Are you okay? All of our taxpayer dollars going towards buying identifications for people. Am I okay with our taxpayer money going to buy identifications? Why these taxpayer dollars going to buy identifications? Well, I, I mean, I guess there's two different points you can look at there. The first point is what is the proper role of government? And then we can go down a whole rabbit trail there. I'm just asking, you know, is it okay? But, but my point is this, my point is this, that the government spends money on a lot of things it should not. But if we're going to do that, the thing we should be spending it on is making sure that we have fair elections because Fair elections is one of the most central things of our government. If we don't have representative government, if we have some, somebody in office who shouldn't be there because of election fraud, then the citizens are not being represented. So if we are going to spend taxpayer money on things other than defending life, liberty, and property, I think this is one thing that should be high on the list. So that's a yes. Yes, I think it should, we should be funding it. All right, thanks, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions with me? Witness? All right, thank you, Mr. Howard. Please leave your witness formally tangled. All right, anyone else to witness in favor of the bill? I'm witnessing um, in favor of the bill. My name is Susan Gibson. I live in Jefferson City. Um, from a personal perspective of how this would affect me and my family, an analogy comes to mind that if you want your garden to flourish, you've got to pull the weeds. And for hundreds of years, families like mine who have been here and followed all the rules don't have a problem with documentation. It's just that simple. In the bigger picture, the difference in who in who wins elections in, in president and who is electable, I should say, in presidential election years and midterm elections is directly attributable to the number of voters who participate and what kinds of voters participate. It's midterm elections that move this country forward. If greater numbers vote, if people who aren't eligible to vote vote, ultimately unions will be strengthened, wages raised, Funding for public education will be strong. Public education. Higher education will become available to more people and the effect will be detrimental upon everything sacred from corporate profits to military ground troops. We simply cannot tolerate this socialist concept of equal, equal opportunity for all. Or mark my words, 
our children will not be able to benefit from all that we have gained. Our lifelong efforts will be for naught if the playing field is level, and that is the road we are going down unless you succeed in restricting the vote to eligible voters. I want that to be crystal clear. I see where we are going. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Uh, Ms. Gibson, did you, would you please come back? I think you, I think, just so we can see if anyone has questions. Are there any questions of this witness? And did you leave your witness? I did. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Moving on. All right. Is there anyone here to test or testify against the bill? Excuse me. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm John Scott, excuse me, from the Missouri Secretary of State's office. Um, our office testified against this bill last year and, uh, and the year before that, and I'm here to do the same this year. Um, what I've said before, and I'll say again, is that as the state's chief elections officer, um, it's Secretary of State Kander's job to make sure that only eligible voters vote, but that every eligible voter has the opportunity to vote. Um, that being said, I'm going to just kind of take a step back for a moment and really discuss kind of what we're doing here. Uh, we're revisiting an issue that um, was decided by the Missouri Supreme Court, I think, nine years ago in the Wine Shank decision, whenever they said that um, very similar legislation was uh, an undue burden on a uh, fundamental right. And um, so we're, we're saying, okay, the Supreme Court decided that nine years ago rather than trying to tailor some legislation to pass constitutional muster, what we'd like to do is amend the Constitution so that we don't have to meet strict scrutiny and then pass probably the most far-reaching, most strict form of photo ID um, in the country. So that's really what we're doing here. Let's weaken our voting rights laws so that we can pass the most restrictive photo ID in the country. That's just something that we can't support can't support anything that would disenfranchise a single eligible Missouri voter, um, and that's the way we view this legislation. We really do um, know that it's the most restrictive in the country. It's not just photo ID legislation, and I think most Missourians, if they really knew uh, and, and had the time to, to look into this, would see that it is very, very restrictive and, and the most restrictive form of photo ID in the country, even more restrictive than some um, Piece of legislation from around the country that have been struck down by courts in the last two, three years. Um, but the bottom line is that the bill would result in the disenfranchising of these voters. And uh, unfortunately, in practice, when you start talking about provisional ballots and the way that they would work in a lot of situations, they may not be counted. And, and to, so to say that that's an accurate um, or sorry, that it's a perfect safeguard, it just doesn't really line up with the facts. Um, we know there are lots of groups of Missourians who don't have the ID that uh, this legislation would require. Um, households without a vehicle in the state, about 175,000 households without a vehicle, less likely to drive, less likely to have a driver's license or a photo ID. Um, people who take public transportation, 38,000 families. Um, Missourians over the age of 75, almost 400,000. These are, I think, 2012 numbers, maybe 2010. College students, 450,000 in Missouri, and we know that that number is climbing. Um, can't use their student ID under this legislation. Missourians in poverty, 800,000 Missourians, less likely to drive a car, less likely to have the ID that this legislation would require. Um, so we know that. We've been talking about it for years, and we also know that there are less restrictive forms of photo ID that are um, being used around the country. Uh, states like Idaho and Michigan say if you don't have the, the photo ID that this legislation requires, cast a, a ballot, sign an affidavit under the penalty of perjury, and um, if you're found to uh, be committing voter fraud, then voter impersonation fraud, that is, then um, you'll face jail time, you'll face felonies. Um, 
and other forms of photo ID actually try to get IDs into the hands of people who don't have them, try to seek out uh, people who don't have those and say, okay, let's try to reduce the number of folks that don't have the ID. Let's take a proactive approach and try to find out who those folks are. That's not something that's done in this legislation. Um, we know that around the country, um, forms of photo ID piece of legislation are being struck down all the time. Um, we know that in Texas, they've been embarrassed publicly by the fact that former speakers of the House are going to vote and aren't allowed to vote because of the uh, restricted nature of the legislation. Uh, we know that federal judges who have upheld photo ID laws have said, gosh, I wish I had that one back. Uh, if I knew now, or if I knew then what I knew now, I wouldn't have ruled the same way. Um, the bottom line is the legislation is just too restrictive. We can't support anything that would disenfranchise a single eligible Missouri voter. Questions of this witness? To inquire, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Scott. Thank you so much for testifying on this uh, bill again. Um, we've been at this for quite a long time. Uh, we don't have, uh, as, as committee members, a fiscal note in front of us in terms of the cost of this bill. Um, can you you have that information? Um, one of our members received it. Do you know what the cost would this be at least for the first um, year of implementation? Uh, I don't have it in front of me either, but I am somewhat familiar with the fiscal notes from the past. Um, there's anytime you start talking about a special election, you start talking about um, statewide costs of a special election. <clears throat> about seven million dollars is what a special election costs in the state of Missouri. Then you start talking about the notification. Um, you know, we would want to let Missouri voters know, hey, there's a new requirement. Um, make sure you have this identification when you get to the polls. Things have changed. Um, best way to do that would be to go through broadcast media, and that gets very, very expensive. Um, so, yeah, there are some serious. So, so there is a very, very serious cost. And I think we've had other representatives point out too is that you know some of our budgeting issues of things that we cannot fund in our state because we don't have the dollars. And yet, based on zero evidence of any voter impersonation fraud in Missouri, this bill would require, um, on this document my colleague has, um, over $6 million the first year alone in terms of just that providing that uh, those uh, uh, documents, let alone the cost that Secretary of State was involved in terms of notifying. But the thing that's actually sort of missing is what the cost of people would entail to actually get those documents based on other statutes of what you need to have that driver's license or non-driver's license. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about that the bill sponsor pointed out that just seemed like it was a glaring hole, talking about uh, provisional ballots. And he mentioned that most of the time those are counted. And then he also mentioned that um, if they're not counted, it's usually because they're not registered to vote. Well, if you're not registered to vote, then your name is not going to be on the voter roll on election day, correct? Right. So therefore, when you walk in, if your name is missing from that voter roll, are you going to be given a provisional ballot? I'm sorry, one more time. If your name is not on that voter roll, if you have not registered, would an election clerk give you a provisional ballot? Well, I can't speak to what every you know clerk would do. I, you know, that we have legally. Yeah, sure. Um, I think federal law says that you can vote a provisional ballot, you know, that, that people have to be. Even if they're not registered to vote. I think what um, Representative Duggar was getting at is sort of the practice of the counting of provisional ballots. And so um, and I think his point was you know, that sometimes provisional ballots aren't counted, and it's not because a, um, you know, he said not registered. I think he was probably getting at maybe not registered in that jurisdiction. And I think that that gets to the point of a lot of voters probably don't know that nuance. They probably don't know that if they're signing that provisional ballot, that if they're not registered at that polling place, then it, it won't be counted. Um, and this legislation doesn't call for election authorities sitting down, going through things with that voter and saying, hey, just so you know, if you're casting this provisional ballot. It's not going to be counted if you're not registered here, here, let me help you get to your proper jurisdiction. So um, I think that's maybe a little clarification. Thank you. And also, um, 
you know, the fact that uh, uh, do you guys have a, uh, does the Secretary of State's office have a figure in terms of the number of provisional ballots that are actually counted? Uh, I think kind of varies around 25, 30% over the last few elections. So under under this proposal, if a, a voter was to show up and didn't meet all these requirements and were given a provisional ballot, the likelihood of their voter their vote actually counting in that election is pretty slim, isn't it? Unfortunately, yes. So I just want to point out that there's a that safeguard that looks like it's written there to protect voters um, is is false. But thank you. Good morning, Scott Howard, sir. I want to ask you a few questions on the, the secretary's thoughts on fraud. What are what are some things that you guys are doing with regards to fraud in the election process? Sure. Um, you know, we I think last year, the beginning of last year, formed the elections integrity unit within our office, and um, the goal of that unit is to sort of open things up for people to say, hey, I've noticed regularities. Um, I suspect that fraud is taking place. I'd like to contact the Secretary of State's office, um, sort of fill them in on what I've seen. We document uh, all of those complaints. We have a hotline. Um, people can email our office, and each one of those gets a response. We look into it. We talk to uh, local election authorities. We talk to county prosecutors. Um, so that's the, the unit. Uh, we've also formed the Elections Integrity Task Force, which has a lot of um, well-respected county clerks from around the state and election authorities. Um, also some folks in law enforcement um, and in local government with the idea of being, hey, let's share best practices and let's get together um, after each election and then as necessary to say, okay, what are ways that we can better communicate and, like I said, share best practices, talk about what's working, um, what could be working better. Um, so those are some things we've done to proactively um, try to tackle the issue. And from the outside looking in, it looks like the secretary is making efforts to uh, a collaborate effort to um, stand out for all. Is that correct? That's right. I mean, we take it very so, seriously. So I think that goes without saying that if these kind of efforts are taking place, this type of resources are being put around elections integrity unit, should that tell the state of Missouri that there's something wrong with the integrity of elections? I mean, to me, that's from the outside looking in, that's what it looks like to me. If, if the secretary has to do all these things and set up uh, committees and, and have a task force and those type of things, me, me as a voter, I'm concerned that, that these type of things are going on. Is that something that he shares or is that we're just taking proactive measures to, to stand out for all these? Well, what we wanted to do was be proactive, and I think if you go back to whenever the secretary launched the, the unit and launched the task force, and you know, we want to do everything that we can to prevent you know anyone from trying to uh, game the system. Um, you know, but when we do see people that are gaming the system, we want to make sure that people act swiftly, communicate effectively, um, and that we can minimize those things as much as possible. Thank you, Mr. Scott, for being here this morning. Question for you, sir. Let me understand the process. If I show up to, elect, to a, an election, uh, I don't have an ID, um, I sign a provisional ballot. That provisional ballot goes back to the <laughs> clerk. Clerk then compares my signature to the signature that is on file at I'm a registered voter. Is that correct? That's right. So then it does get counted. Is that correct? Well, they have to. It's called verifying your identification. So they would have to make sure that the signature matches. They would also have to make sure that you were an eligible voter. They would also have to make sure that you were registered um, in that jurisdiction. So the same process happens. I, my vote is counted. Sure, if they verify your identification on a provisional ballot, that's the same thing. If I show up at the election poll, they're going to verify my ID. I mean, I go there now and hand them my voter ID card. And, they look at that and I look at the records and I sign. So even if I sign a provisional ballot, if I am registered to vote, it gets counted. If you're registered to vote in that jurisdiction. But I can't register I can't vote in that jurisdiction if I'm not, correct? That's right. So the, so my vote gets counted. Oh, if I'm ready to vote in that district, it gets counted. If 
you're voting at say the county clerk's office you know then that's not necessarily your polling place or not necessarily your district but yeah to your point if a person if the person casts a provisional ballot and it's verified count it so it does get counted it's yeah. not this big nebulous thing that if i cast a provisional ballot it's not going to get counted well i mean it's going to get verified which it should sure and then it's going to get counted if it's verified, so what's the right. problem with provisional ballots if i'm not elected if i'm not registered in that particular place to vote it doesn't get counted it shouldn't be correct well if i understand what you're saying what, what i'm saying well it's is just a yes or no should it be counted or not if i'm not registered to vote in that district should it not be counted it shouldn't be counted correct I think every eligible voter should have the opportunity to vote. And unfortunately, I'm answering the question. If I'm not registered in that district, I am answering the question. I should not be able to vote there. It shouldn't be counted, correct? What I'm saying is if you're eligible eligible to vote in Missouri, we want to do everything that we possibly can to make sure that your vote is counted. And unfortunately, the history of provisional balloting shows us that oftentimes people will cast a provisional ballot, not maybe understanding the nuance and their vote isn't counted. Maybe they were running late. Maybe they're not at their polling place for one reason or another. I don't think the average Missourian knows that. So to put them on a pathway for a provisional ballot is going to put their vote at risk. And I don't view the provisional ballot in that scenario as an adequate safeguard. So what we have is a problem about education about provisional ballots, which this legislation doesn't address. Okay, well, that's not germane to this. And we need to address the issue about education provisional ballots. But if I show up and I'm not registered to vote, and I show up at that precinct, I don't need to vote, correct? Your vote's not going to be counted. Yeah. And if I'm signed a provisional ballot and I'm not supposed to vote in that precinct, it's going to be counted. And it shouldn't. I'm in the wrong place. That's why they send out those little cards. Give your polling locations and your addresses. Yeah. Which wouldn't be, a, a person wouldn't be able to use that under this legislation. So the, the, let the piece that, that you where I have to go to vote right but I hope that you have more than that with you under, if, under this bill or else you won't be able to vote I just I'm trying to figure out why provisional balance are a bad thing if I'm registered to vote in that district that gets counted thanks sir any other questions from this witness I have Mr. Smith oh, um, Scott to be a resident the state do I have to have identification to be a resident of this do I have to have identification to, to live in Missouri no and one more thing about that provisional ballot uh, question that was going on because it's a lot of information uh, do you have to come back after three days you, you cast the provisional ballot then three days later you have to appear bring some sort of identification or if anybody can help me out with that. Yes, sir. That's part of the process. Um, okay. So then you would have to come back. That provisional take time off work. I don't know, maybe find child care. Clear it up. It's it's not, I have my provisional ballot and then go to the house, watch the game. It's all good. No, three days later, I have to come back bringing more material, I guess. For, for. That's right. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions on this witness? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Scott. Please leave here. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify in opposition to House Bill 30. My name is Denise Lieberman. I'm a senior attorney with Advancement Project, which is a racial justice organization, and I represent the interests of the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition, an ad hoc coalition of about two dozen organizations opposed to this measure. Um, I've submitted to you in advance of this hearing a written testimony that includes uh, substantial sources to uh, recognize authority in the area, so I'm going to use my time here today to address some of the questions that have been raised thus far in today's hearing. Um, uh, this is the ninth time that we have been come together around uh, nearly identical legislation since the Missouri Supreme Court found that photo ID in Missouri violates our Constitution. They found that it is a heavy and substantial burden on Missourians' free exercise of the right of suffrage. And I submit to you, I agree with uh, Mr. Scott and the Secretary of State's office that this bill before you 
would be the strictest in the nation. In my role uh, as a voting rights attorney, I'm considered one of the nation's leading legal experts on voter identification laws. I've served as counsel on photo ID litigation here in Missouri twice, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, and now in North Carolina. Uh, and I can tell you that the provision before you stacks up as the most strict in the nation. Representative Smith, you would actually be allowed to use that concealed carry ID to vote in Texas. This proposal is more strict than the photo ID law in Texas, which has been uh, found to be unconstitutional by a federal court. That case is currently up on appeal in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. This law is also more strict than the photo ID law passed in 2011 in Wisconsin, which was also found by a federal court to be unconstitutional. That case is currently pending in front of United States Supreme Court. What we know and what we've seen over the ensuing nine years, with each passing year, the evidence continues to mount, proving that the asserted justifications for these laws hold no water. Every single academic study conducted in this country proves without a shadow of a doubt that voter impersonation is exceedingly rare. I respect that people may continue to believe that it exists, but simply because some folks believe that the world may be flat doesn't make it so. These academic studies have been verified, peer-reviewed over and over and over uh, and accepted by all authorities. In fact, even proponents of voter ID laws now in other states, um, I'm currently litigating against the voter ID law in North Carolina, they no longer claim that the law is necessary to protect against voter fraud. They're now asserting that the laws um, uh, uh, are, are intended to enhance voter confidence in the integrity of the election process. Now that's something that you cited as well as a, a justification behind this law, but I'll let you know that a federal judge in Wisconsin found that just the opposite was true. In fact, just this year, um, a federal judge, Judge Lynn Edelman in Wisconsin, concluded that that same justification didn't hold water, finding that photo ID laws decrease voter confidence in the integrity of elections, not increase them. The court from Caney County mentioned a story about absentee ballots and concerns about identity there. And that's a valid concern. Uh, in fact, if we are concerned in this state about addressing voter fraud, we do well to look at the absentee voting process because this bill doesn't require any photo ID or any sort of identification to submit an absentee ballot. This bill would not address the concerns raised by that clerk in Taney County. The savings clauses in this legislation. Representative Duggar, I, I do appreciate that over the years you have, you have listened to the people who've come here to testify, who've described the burdens that they may face obtaining voter ID, but the savings clauses simply don't hold up. And I want to specifically address the issue of provisional ballots. Um, to address your question, Representative Kidd, for people who don't meet one of the exceptions, if they show up without ID, they would be forced to cast a provisional ballot. They would have to return to the election authority within three days with the requisite ID. So for people who don't have that ID, their vote will never count, okay? Uh, and they're not going to be able to get one within three days. For people who meet the exceptions uh, in, in, your, in your bill, Representative Duggar, um, seniors, people with disabilities, people who assert that they are unable to afford the underlying documents, they are also made to cast a provisional ballot. And Representative Kidd, the only circumstance under which that provisional ballot is counted is if the signature on the provisional ballot envelope matches the signature on file with the election authority with their voter registration for the most impacted communities, such as seniors, people with disabilities, those signatures will often not match. And I have a very personal example. My own mother is in that boat. Um, she has been a registered voter in the state of Missouri since 1952. She served honorably um, on the school board in her community for 24 years. She's never missed an election, but she's got a birth certificate glitch. The name under which she is registered to vote is not the name on her birth certificate. She attempted to have it amended 
but uh, Representative Smith, like like your mother's situation, it looks completely false. Someone just wrote in the, the name. Um, but even, you might say, well, she, she qualifies for the exception. She's a senior citizen. She is. And she would be forced to cast a provisional ballot. Well, she's 83. In the last decade, she's developed a severe hand tremor, and she cannot duplicate her signature under any circumstance. That signature will not match the vote of a valid registered voter would not be counted. And so let's be clear that the people who would be forced to cast provisional ballots under this provision are people who are registered. Provisional ballots are also available for people who appear at the polls whose names can't be found on the roster. But what we're talking about here are people who show up at the poll whose names are on the roster but can't produce qualified ID. They are, in fact, on the list. They're valid registered voters. And there's numerous circumstances in which those votes wouldn't be counted. There's other circumstances that that provisional ballot won't be counted. The signatures of election judges from both political parties must be on the provisional ballot envelope. If one signature is missing, the ballot gets thrown out. The voter signature has to be on there. If it's missing, it will be thrown out. If other information on that provisional ballot envelope is not filled out correctly, it doesn't get counted. There are numerous people who, even with the, the savings clauses like provisions for those who can't afford underlying documents would still be unable to get a photo ID. People who don't have birth certificates and Representative Smith, the circumstance you described with your mother being born to a midwife, um, I can't tell you how many of my clients in these other photo ID cases fall into that same category. Born to midwives either have no birth certificate or have birth certificates that are riddled with errors. We had my client in Wisconsin had to spend $2,500 she was also from Mississippi. To hire a lawyer in Mississippi to go to court to like get a legal name change to, to try and get the error on her birth certificate corrected so that she could then go back to Wisconsin and use that birth certificate in order to get a state issued photo ID. Uh, so this is not a cost free endeavor for voters. It's not cost free for the state either. Uh, Representative Newman, the fiscal note for this legislation was posted um, on January the 25th, but I found it last night on the internet. And what I'll suggest to you is that even with the, the seven million dollars or so that's suggested in that fiscal note, that severely underestimates the actual cost that the state would incur in implementing this legislation. What we've seen in other states is that the cost hover much closer to $20 million. And there's numerous national studies that have documented why that is. Some of those uh, reasons were discussed by uh, Mr. Scott in the Secretary of State's office. Um, so I want to make sure that other people have the opportunity to testify so you can continue to hear from the numerous voters and the various burdens that, um, that they may befall. But I urge this body not to fall prey to this partisan ploy. We should not be using and manipulating our election system for political gain. Missouri law already provides ample protections. We require all voters to show identification in this state. Many of the people who would be affected by this legislation have ID. And so the, the witness who said, well, we should be looking to get IDs for people. Many of these folks have ID, and those IDs wouldn't work to vote in this state. That is the wrong direction for the state of Missouri to go. It's the wrong message to send to over 220,000 valid voters of this state that their participation is not wanted. And it, it flies in the face of the direction of where the law in this nation is going on this issue. I urge you to vote no on this legislation. Thank you. To inquire, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Lieberman. I know that you have been here consistently uh, giving us a, a background on voter identification uh, proposals, just like this one. Uh, uh, the one I reiterate, your organization that you work for is a national organization, and is it partisan? No, we are a nonpartisan organization. And you also are involved in voter protection in terms of making sure that elections are, uh, particularly here in Missouri, are carried out according to the statutes that we already uh, have in effect, correct? So when you look at that and you look at your experience around the state, particularly you know, in litigating these other cases, what do you presume is the intent behind this bill? Well, I can I can tell you what's been proven up in, in the other cases. 
um, in, in Texas, there was compelling evidence that was presented in the court audit that, that legislatures passed these laws uh, to in, for partisan gain, for political gain, that target particular communities, such as communities of color, particularly African Americans and Latinos, low income voters, seniors, people with disabilities because of their propensity to vote um, in a particular political way. Uh, and in Texas, the court found that evidence of legislative intent to be convincing and found that the law violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act that the legislature had a discriminatory intent in passing that legislation. And Ms. Lieberman, going back to the uh, the constitutional challenge to this original uh, law back in 2006, uh, the reason why our state constitution found this as a violation was, again, our constitution currently protects the right to vote. We have a provision in our constitution guaranteeing that the right of suffrage shall be free to all voters in Missouri. The Missouri Supreme Court found that legislation nearly identical to this bill violated the right to vote. And that's why the legislation that's before you right now is unconstitutional. It could not be implemented constitutionally in the state of Missouri. So think about that. You're considering legislation that is patently unconstitutional. We would have to change the Constitution to carve out an exception to that part of the Constitution in order for this to stand. And, and along that line, Missouri does have one of the strictest voter rights, correct, in our own state constitution. We, we currently do. Uh, we, we wouldn't if HJR would pass us. So thank you. And I guess you, you indicated to the, the numbers of people who, uh, including your mother, the longtime eligible voters. Uh, but can you tell us real quickly, again, the groups of people that who would be infected by this legislation? A absolutely. Um, approximately 10% of, of people nationwide don't have a current state-issued photo ID. Uh, and these are people that may have other forms of ID, but those IDs may be expired. And so, for example, senior citizens uh, um, are twice as likely to lack a current ID because they can use their expired driver's license and it works perfectly well to cash checks to get on planes to do the other things that we need. Um, they may use Medicare cards or other things like that. Um, Low-income voters who are less likely to drive. Um, voters of color are about 10% of, of people nationwide lack a photo ID. For African Americans, 25% of African Americans nationwide lack a current state issued photo ID. And when you combine that, with overlay it with income and age, the numbers are staggering. In Wisconsin, one study by the University of Wisconsin found that of African American men aged 18 to 24, 78 percent of African American men aged 18 to 24 in Wisconsin lack a current Wisconsin ID. That that level of detail hasn't been done here in Missouri, but those statistics uh, ring true in these cases that have gone on throughout the country. Uh, voters of color low-income voters, students who may not have a current ID but have plenty of other forms of ID, senior citizens, veterans, people with disabilities are far disproportionately more likely to lack a state issue photo ID and face barriers to getting a new one. Thank you. Mr. McGall. Clark. Lieberman, thank you for being here this morning. I appreciate your expertise. I wanted to follow up on the question that Ms. Newman asked you about the uh, advancement project. Uh, are you currently being paid to be here today? I receive an annual salary to work as an attorney. This is among That's my various good. duties. And I did a little research on the advancement project. And since 2009, about $4.5 million has been paid to the Advancement Project by uh, the Open Society Institute and the Foundation to promote the Open Society. Is that correct? I can't speak very precisely to, uh, to, to, to all of our funders. That's not my department. I'm a senior attorney with the organization. I don't work in our development department. But you understand that the person who's in basically started these foundations is George Soros. Is that correct? Uh, actually, no, the folks who started our organization, well, oh, I mean, George oh, Soros founded. Open Society Institute 
I don't know a whole lot about the Open Society Institute. I can tell you who founded the NASA project, though. Uh, well, I, I kind of want to know about George Soros donating $4.5 million to your organization. I, you know, my, my understanding is that the Open Society Institute funds um, uh, uh, dozens upon dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds, of, of not-for-profit organizations. You, you won't deny that you may or may not be being paid by George Soros right now. <laughs> I don't think I'd say that. I'd be paid by Advancement Project right now, and I can't speak to it. We have so many um, uh, uh, foundations uh, and, and, and individuals who fund the, the organization. I, I can't really speak to where all the funding comes from. Within your statement, you stated that the evidence is now undisputed that voter impersonation is virtually non-existent. Is that existent? Is that correct? That is correct. Um, the entire body of academic evidence to date supports that statement. Can you tell me where in the Missouri statute the voter impersonation statute is? Let me help you. It's not there. There's no such thing in Missouri as voter impersonation. We only have class one election offenses right. because as mr duggar said you know, voter, voter impersonation and i hope you would admit would be pretty hard to prove would you agree with that statement well I, i'm not sure i'm not sure i agree with that statement. so you're a, you're a national elections expert but you're not sure if it's no, hard well, to prove uh, voter impersonation. So, so allow me to clarify what i can tell you is, is how they have proved it in these academic studies um and that is that that um, academics have gone through and combed through um, all of the election returns. So I just finished doing this in, in one of my cases. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Professor Lori Minaiti out of Rutgers, who's one of the nation's leading experts on this, um, combed through all of the voter returns, all the voter files over a 10 year period. Um, not only did she pull all of the prosecutions, she also pulled all the investigations. She went to clerks in every county, interviewed them. She interviewed police officers. She interviewed like a whole host of people and pulled every single available public document as well as documents from the Secretary of State's offices and county election officials in, in each of those jurisdictions uh, in order to compile all of the data necessary. And this sort of research has been replicated by other scholars as well. Would you deny that there is any fraud in the state of Missouri in regards to voting? No, I'm certain that there's fraud in Missouri with regard to voting, but none that a photo ID requirement would address. So if we're concerned about the absentee voting process, where I think there's there's um, at least the potential for greater fraud since uh, the person is mailing a ballot in, this legislation wouldn't address that. This legislation wouldn't address um, errors in voter registration applications. This legislation wouldn't address the actual areas where problems in the voting process actually occur. This legislation would address one, one infraction only, in-person voter impersonation. So you, don't, you don't think that this photo ID would be a means to the end to stop all fraud in the state? No, there's no way you don't have to show a photo ID in order to register to vote or to submit an absentee ballot in those now, two areas. Within your Pro. statement, you also state that HGR 1 would conflict with at least two other provisions of the Constitution. And I, we're running out of time, and I've got a bunch of questions. So if you can give me those two specific statutes. Yes, Article 1, Section 8, and Article 1, Section 25. And, and you further state that the right to vote shall be altered only in the most compelling of circumstances. Is that correct? I suggest that, well, that goes to the HJR. Um, well, yes. I'm going to run everything together at this point. I hope that's okay. But Yes, my argument is that we shouldn't amend the Constitution to strip away a fundamental right absent absolutely okay. what, what, compelling what, circumstances. Now, tell me what, you, in your legal opinion, would be compelling. What would be compelling enough that we we should look at the statutes and say, this needs to be looked at. When people show up to the polls, they yeah. need to prove who they are. Without I am hard pressed to, to, to identify an example uh, that would be compelling enough to strip a fundamental right out of our Constitution. I, I don't disagree with you, but I, I do want to point your attention. I'm sure you know about this. In 2000, Secretary of State Matt Blunt did an investigation in St. Louis where he found that 62 felons had voted 52 state fel federal felons had voted, 52 state felons had voted, 68 people had voted twice, 14 people who were dead cast votes, 79 people were registered to, vo to vote at vacant lots, and 250 people were at addresses where eight or more registered voters had voted. I mean, is that compelling enough that we should do something to make sure?
sure that only el eligible voters are voting? I absolutely believe only eligible voters should vote. And I'm not familiar with those statistics, but what I will tell you is that someone who improperly well, votes let me, let me read, let me read some more, let me read and some a photo more ID facts. law wouldn't address that problem. Let That's me read what some I'm more facts you. for you. Maybe this would be compelling. Auditor Claire McCaskill in 2003 said that 24,000 of St. Louis City's voters were questionable. That report tabulated 4,405 dead people on the rolls, 2,242 felons, 1,453 people voting from vacant lots, 15,163 registered voters somewhere else in Missouri or Illinois. Is that not compelling enough that we should say, hold on just a second, we, we should clean this up? Sure, then I would encourage this committee to consider legislation that would look at the uh, cleaning up the voter rolls. But the photo ID in, bill wouldn't address that. In regards to your mother, and, and you said she had a hand tremor. Your mother was here, lovely lady. Yes. Uh, could she not re-register to vote with the documents she could re-register with, sign a new voter card, and then be able to vote? She has no basis to re-register. She hasn't moved. No. Well, she's being denied because her signature doesn't match. I mean, I'm saying, could she do that? Could she do no, that? No, I don't believe she can. She has not moved. She's not changed her residence or status. She doesn't have. She's if not the election right authority denies her absentee ballot or provisional ballot because of the signature, you're saying she couldn't re-register with a new signature? That is my understanding. And you state that uh, House Bill 30 uh, would implement a restrictive voter ID provision. That's basically what you're saying. It's most restrict restrictive in the country more restricted than Texas. Okay. Now, I want to point your attention to 42 U.S. Code Section 15483. Are you familiar with that? 42 U.S. Code 15483. That's the Help America Vote Act. And it says that if I register to vote using a utility bill or a bank statement, that the very first time I go to vote, what do you think I have to use? Under the Help America Vote Act of 2002, if you are a first-time voter who registered by mail, the first time that you present in person to vote, you do have to show identification, but it can be any number of a number of forms of identification and not nearly as restrictive as the proposal before you here. And that's really what the problem is. It's not really the issue of requiring voters to show ID, because we already do that. It's how limiting this particular list is. The Help America Vote Act includes a list that is far broader than the list of IDs that this legislation would consider. But it is, it is in line with what H. Bill 30 is in regards to identification. No, in fact, current Missouri law mirrors the Help America Vote Act. Current Missouri law, the identification that all voters are required to show at the polls actually mirrors the list of identification in the Help America Vote Act. So all in all, with your testimony that you submitted in written form, you're saying that if if and when challenged, that the court will apply strict scrutiny and that we have no compelling governmental interest to restrict what you call restrict voting in this way by showing a photo, photo ID. Is that correct? It's not just me saying that. Missouri Supreme Court said exactly that. And so also what you're saying is that folks who vote legally, their votes aren't disenfranchised at all by someone who votes illegally. That's not what I'm saying. I don't okay. well, that, that's what I wanted you to say. So you're saying that if I vote legally, it's okay for my vote to be cast out because someone else votes illegally. Of course not. How can you not say that? How can you not say I'm disenfranchised by every person who votes without justification? Absolutely. No one should vote who's not eligible to vote. And, and this whole state suffers if, that's, if that happens. And I think that's where our difference of opinion is. But this legislation we're trying, wouldn't. We're trying to safeguard. We're trying to safeguard the millions of people who vote legally. Okay. Well, then I would suggest that you who vote look at the absentee illegal. voting process and and the voter rolls and the areas where. So with the, the absentee, absentee, I want to go back exists. to the absentee pro process. Have you voted absentee? I have voted absentee. Okay, and and you would you would testify today that to vote absentee, you have to have that absentee ballot verified. If you send it in by mail, it has to be notarized. You have to sign it in front of a notary right. unless you are on the permanently disabled absentee voter list, in which case your your envelope would not require a notarized signature. So you're saying all the problems we have in the state are via absentee ballot? 
I'm not saying that's all the problems. I'm not, saying that that is not a the amount of people that I've, that I've talked about in St. Louis that are registered in other places that are dead that are voting. I mean, this is this isn't black and white. This was an audit done by Claire McCaskill. This is a report done by Secretary of State Matt Blunt. This is whenever. So Governor Bob why, Holden went in after the 2003 election and cleaned the house in St. Louis because he said, and I quote, it is a mess down there. Yep, and you know what happened after so, that? In 2006, Missouri adopted the statewide uniform voter registration database, and that allowed the different county databases to talk to each other. A big problem with the voter rolls prior to that was that each county clerk maintained their own separate lists. And so when you move from one county to the other, the other county didn't know to take you off the first county. That's why the rules were a mess. Now we have a statewide uniform voter registration database. It was implemented in 2006. In fact, Secretary of State Carnahan was sued um, over, over that. And the courts found that, in fact, she had met the, the obligations under that law and had cleaned up the rules. So you don't see those kinds of problems because we have a unified voter registration database across the state now. All right, we're going to take five more minutes, and Logan has a question of this witness. Uh, then we are going to then we are going to recess, uh, and upon adjournment of, of the uh, session upstairs, we'll be back in this room for about an hour. So again, let me emphasize: people have come a long way today to give their testimony in this committee. So let's be cognizant of the time here, folks. Okay, we all want to get heard. We still have one more bill to hear. So let's let's think about what we're going to say. Well, I'm, I'm thankful that you're all here today, but let's be very careful. We don't constantly repeat or anything like that. Okay? All right, Mr. Duggan, we're going to give you just a few minutes with this witness. Madam Chair, um, thank you, uh, Ms. Lieberman, for um, addressing uh, this, this body. And uh, I'd just like to ask a couple questions about the origin of photo ID legislation. Um, is it my, uh, am I correct to believe that when you spoke uh, that you referred to this as a partisan initiative? Well, if you look at the at, at the development of voter ID legislation across the country, uh, including the huge swath that occurred um, after the 2010 midterm elections, uh, it has been generally identified um, as a partisan initiative. Okay. Um, is President, former President Jimmy Carter, a Democrat or a Republican? <laughs> when he was president, he was a Democrat. Right. Um, and did he not, with James Baker, who was a Republican, have a bipartisan commission in which they both presented photo ID as one potential uh, remedy for any types of uh, voter integrity issues and to uh, satisfy voters' concerns that our elections are conducted in a free and fair manner? Correct. You're referring to the Carter Baker Commission on Election Reform that um, that uh, included, among numerous recommendations, um, a voter ID provision that is much, much, much different and broader than what is being proposed here. Um, I, wait, wait, let me just clarify. Of the idea? You said the origin of the idea was a partisan one, and actually it was a bipartisan one. No, not necessarily. Uh, and I also want to bring your attention to the, the way, first of all, that, that what they were talking about was voter identification. That kind of provision ended up in the Help America Vote Act of 2002. It includes a broad range of, of, of voter IDs. In the ensuing years since the Carter Baker Commission met, um, lots of additional evidence has come out. And so, for example, um, Richard Posner, who's considered one of the most conservative federal judges in the country, sits on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, originally upheld Indiana's voter ID law back when it was first challenged. Indiana was one of, one of the first states in the nation to pass photo ID. Um, and he uh, came out last year uh, and indicated uh, that he was wrong, that at the time, the evidence simply didn't exist um, as to how people would be affected and disenfranchised by photo ID, photo ID laws. And he, um, the, one of the most conservative jurists in the country, now says he was wrong to vote in favor of voter ID. In our Wisconsin litigation, he actually wrote a, a very uh, strongly worded opinion um, uh, on arguing that photo ID laws were unconstitutional um, just this past year. Is there any version of a photo ID bill which you would support? 
not not this particular legislation, but with amendments, is there? Yeah, you know, I, I think that the problem here is that that there's no way for people who don't have the ID or can't get it to actually cast a regular ballot. And so um, the states that that Mr. Scott mentioned, like Idaho, Michigan, who allow some out a way for voters who can't get the ID to still cast a regular ballot and have that ballot counted, like through a, an identification affidavit system, would, would go a long way. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Lieberman, thank you for your testimony. I just want to follow up because that last question raised one of the points that I uh, wanted to make uh, before we exact this bill out of committee. The point is not necessarily the ability to acquire that identification. The constitutional point of this effort is should any individual be required to use their personal finances and money to pay for an identification, birth certificate, divorce certificate, or whatever, in order to take that documentation back to the state of Missouri and then be able to register to vote. The fact of the matter is not necessarily acquiring the identification. The fact of this bill is that we are imposing what could be interpreted as a poll tax to those individuals who are attempting to get identification. Certainly we are willing to pay for that documentation if that person has those official records within the state of Missouri. There is no attempt to allow persons financial assistance to acquire that documentation from other states, other registrars, or other courts in order to bring that material back to their local election official and be given the identification necessary to have their vote counted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would agree with that, Representative Conway, and so did the Missouri Supreme Court saying that the photo ID law was tantamount to a poll tax um, for just those reasons. Even when we remove the cost from getting the ID, the cost of getting the underlying documents really can be um, significant, especially if those documents have errors and they need to be corrected through court proceedings, if those documents are located out of state. Um, so birth certificates could cost 30, and one state even has $45 to get a birth certificate, uh, and that could cost time, money, not to mention the, 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 the non-monetary costs of having to go to numerous government agencies, take time off work, find childcare, et cetera. Uh, and so indeed, let's remember that when uh, uh, the Voting Rights Act was passed, starting down poll taxes, that poll tax was about $1.50. We're talking about costs that uh, far exceed even the modern day uh, uh, equivalent of that. Thank you, Mr. Lieberman. Please leave your witness form on the desk. We will recess until adjournment of session. We'll be back in this room for about an hour. Thank you, folks. It will be about 30 minutes. <laughs>